Okay, and we are live. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, those of you who have signed up, we've been chatting a little bit about Zazie's book, and um, you've already posted some questions, which I have on my list to ask today. Uh, oh, quickly, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kelly. I own Dog Kind Training, and I specialize in fearful dogs. Um, and Zazie has written a whole book on the science behind helping anxious, fearful, and reactive dogs. So I think a lot of you will find this uh, very applicable to, to your dogs and your life. Um, welcome, Zazie. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, would you be willing to just take a minute and um, tell people a little bit about your background and how you came to write about fearful dogs? Sure. Thank you so much for inviting me to come and chat with you. It's a pleasure to be here. So I'm Zazie Todd. I uh, used to be a psychologist, like a human psychologist. And then after I moved to Canada, I got into dogs and I discovered canine science and I was hooked. <laughs> so I'm the author of three books now, Wag the Science of Making Your Dog Happy, Per the Science of Making Your Cat Happy, and my new book, Bark, The Science of Helping Your Anxious, Fearful or Reactive Dog. And actually, you can see all three of them on the shelves there behind me <laughs> um, and I wrote Bark because I hope it will bring hope to people with an anxious fearful or reactive dog because I know how difficult it can be and how hard it is for the guardian never mind that the dog is struggling often the dog's guardian is struggling too so that's why I wrote that so true um, I think lots of lots of people here know how how hard it is um, when you're trying to help your sensitive dog and you just don't know what to do. Um, we have some really nice, um, insightful and thoughtful questions submitted by our uh, Facebook group folks, uh, newsletter list, and people in my membership and Confidence Builders course. And I'm gonna start with a couple of questions uh, from Lee. And this is um, relevant to your other books as well. She said, um, if someone has a fearful or anxious dog, do you think it's important for them to read WAG before reading Bark? Does Bark stand alone or build upon topics discussed in WAG? That's a great question. And I've had a few people ask me that, actually. So I think there are people who want to know the answer. Bark stands on its own. So if your dog is anxious or fearful and you need help, then I would start with Bark. But I think both dogs can be helpful. Wag is more about how to provide for what your dog needs throughout their life from getting a puppy right through to senior dogs and, and the end of life so that's about what your dog needs for any kind of dog and then bark it's the same approach but it's specific to anxious and fearful dogs it stands on its own so they complement each other but you can start with whichever one you think is most relevant to you so new dog probably wag fearful or anxious dog definitely bark bark okay wonderful um and I'll occasionally stop and check on comments. Estelle says she loved WAG and can't wait to start reading Bark. And thank you thank for you. being here. Um, <laughs> thank you. Grant says hello from New Jersey. Hello. I used to hello. live here. Um, okay, another interesting question from Lee. And I know there was at least one paper published somewhat recently on this topic. Do dogs sense the moods, emotional states, or pain of people around them? And does this affect the dog's mood or behavior? For example, if a dog's guardian has chronic pain or severe anxiety, will the dog be negatively affected even if the guardian's outward behavior is calm and positive? That's a great question. And there is some research that shows that dogs are sensitive to our moods. They seem to be quite good at reading body language. They can tell if we are angry or happy, for example. There was even some, some research in which people pretended to cry to see if the dog would come to comfort them or not. So we know that dogs are indeed quite sensitive to our moods and not just reading our body language, but also it seems that there's some kind of odor associated with feeling anxious. So they they seem to be able to detect that as well. So that answers the first part of the question. Yes, they do know something about how we're feeling. But the other part is about how that affects the dog. So they will, if they are a bit concerned, they will look to us for guidance. And there's been some really interesting research which has used 
um, a fan with green str green streamers coming from it. It's kind of based on children's research with children, yeah. looking at attachment relationships. But for dogs, they take dogs who think this is something not desperately scary, but certainly not something they're happy and confident with. And they find that the dog will look to their guardian and decide how to respond based on how the guardian responds. So in mm. the research, they tell people to to say things to the fan like oh good fan as if they're talking to a good dog <laughs> or something and then the dog's much more confident in going up to the fan whereas if they're like oh and staying away from it then the dog is not so confident in approaching so the way in which we act towards something does affect how our dogs act now the final part of the question is if the person's I forget exactly what it was, but everything is under control, then the dog's going to be fine. Because, you know, the most important thing actually is that we provide for what the dog needs. And mm. that's the most important thing that we can do for them. Okay, that makes sense. So there, even if you are kind of faking it, faking being calm, that might still help your dog, although they may still be able to, to scent, to smell that you're anxious. Yeah, they may still be able to detect something. No one's done any proper research into like exactly that scenario. So we can't right. say 100%. But yes, you can fake it. And, and that will probably help. <laughs> <laughs> Ruin so much of life. Fake it till you make it. All right. Um, Claire asks, why is it that some dogs, fearful dogs, will quickly trust just one person, but then no one else? And Pancake would also like to know the answer to this, or perhaps he knows the answer, but he's not telling me. Pancake should tell us, I think, and spill the secrets. <laughs> this is actually quite common, especially with some rescue dogs. And that person that they bond with is often, but not always, a woman. And that is thought to be perhaps because some of the backgrounds that this kind of dog comes from they maybe have not had such good experiences with men or maybe not even been socialized much around men and have had much more to do with women and so they perhaps tend to be more friendly and and, and bond to a woman but it, it can be whoever they happen to choose to bond with we don't know their history so we don't know if it just so happens that this person looks like or smells like someone that they used to know in their past it's possible but we do know that they can bond very very quickly with someone and that's actually really nice it's really lovely that they can do that I think uh, Clive Wynn wrote about that a little bit in his book Dog is Love so yeah and, and it's nice that they do that and that's good too because at least they have that one person that they feel safe with but the other thing is it could be that that person is acting in ways that make the dog feel safe so they probably are going to bond with someone who lets them make choices the person who waits for them to choose to come up to them rather than the person who goes up to them and wants to pet them all over and things so that might be part of it as well it could very much be to do with the person's behavior yes I I can definitely see that in many cases. Um, and I've also often wondered if, um, you know, since dogs do, they have been bred over time to, and probably dogs are a bit more social, at least with some people have done better, um, but maybe a dog's sort of motivation to extend themselves to attach to other people is less once they have someone, you know, have a person that they feel safe with. I don't know if that's true, but I've always wondered if that's why some of these really scared rescue dogs, um, they don't have to be rescue dogs, I suppose, um, will almost immediately bond with one person in the family. But then it's like, I don't need you guys for, you know, the rest of the family. If only they could tell us. Um, just saying hello to a few more people. I um, acknowledge that you commented hello folks from Michigan, New Jersey, California, North Carolina. Um, okay, there's another question. Christine, I'll try to get to your question if we can um, after I get through the pre-submitted ones. All right, it's such an interesting topic. Um, Lynn asked, what is the science of, she said her dog is on always on high alert and feels that um, the dog's um, nervous system is like upregulated, I guess, or uh, most of the time. And she's wondering what is the science of soothing a dog's nervous system? If you have anything. Yeah. 
Yeah, so I mean, there is some science on how that might occur, not specifically from dogs, but from research on people and from rats. So things in, in the past may affect the development of the nervous system such that some dogs, people, rats, whatever animal, do tend to have a more upregulated, more anxious, perhaps, nervous system. Um, one of the things that is really important for any any dog, but especially for a dog that is very anxious or fearful, is to make sure that they have a safe space to go to. And that can be a dog bed or a crate, or it could be another room, somewhere where they can choose to go whenever they want, and you will never get them out of that. So that's one thing that's important to provide, because simply having that space can actually make a big difference. Another thing with dogs who are always kind of on high alert is to speak to your veterinarian because your vet can probably recommend some medication that might be quite helpful. And these days, more and more people are willing to use meds and we're seeing, you know, you will have seen Kelly too, that it can make such a big difference. Huge, so, yeah. yeah, so that's something else to bear in mind as well. Um, and giving dogs choice and control and the opportunity to have some downtime, it may take them a while to get there, but but just giving them those options is really important for them. Those are um, great points. So soothing your dog, helping them relax, safe space, medication, making sure that they have choices. Um, a lot of you have talked with me about this in other Facebook Lives about setting up safe spaces and how to help your dog relax. And remember that one of the really important points there was to never... Um, pull them out of the safe space. That can be really scary. Um, Lori asked if she has several dogs and she feels her older dogs have become more fearful since they've added a fearful younger dog. And she's wondering if dogs can learn fear from other dogs. This is something that we don't have much research on, but it's, it's, sounds plausible it's quite possible the other thing though with an older dog if they have a new fear is that i would suggest to get them checked at the vet in case there's something medical going on because these days we know much more about how medical issues such as arthritis or dental issues in older dogs can often link to pain so for example if you have an older dog and all of a sudden they don't like loud noises but previously they could tolerate them or they're not wanting to walk on slippery floors in the kitchen for example it's worth getting them checked at the vet just in case there's something medical going on there so it could well be that they're being influenced by the arrival of a new fearful dog but I think you would want to be sure and make sure that it's not not medical it's not necessarily that other dog being there that's that's causing it oh, that's a great answer okay so so Lori I think you mentioned that one or two of your dogs is a bit older um and I think you mentioned that one of the fears was thunderstorms so that would be loud noises so definitely worth um checking with your vet. Never a bad idea. Um, speaking of storms, Heidi says, we are in the direct path of the hurricane <laughs> and my dog seems agitated. Can he sense it coming even though the weather is currently good? Yeah, so I hope you stay safe and don't have any problems from, from the storm coming in. And I think they probably can sense it because one of the things we say about thunderstorm fears in dogs is that when we're trying to do desensitization and get them used to the sound of thunder it doesn't necessarily work as well as we might hope and we think that's because it's not accompanied by other atmospheric changes that go on in a thunderstorm so if that's the case for thunderstorms i'm sure it's also the case for hurricanes that they can feel the the, the drop in the air pressure ahead of the storm coming in but the other thing to bear in mind is that the people are more anxious and the people are probably acting a bit differently as well, getting ready for it. And they can certainly tell that that's going on too. So it's probably a combination of those things. Probably they can tell that the weather's changing in a way that they don't like because they've experienced storms in the past. But at the same time, perhaps they're, they're noticing that the people are anxious. The routine isn't as normal because people are preparing. Um, so that's probably part of it as well. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, stay safe, Heidi. That um, looks like a scary storm. Um, Adi or Addy, and I'm sorry if I pronounce it incorrectly, asked, um, how does she help a fearful dog, dog who's fearful of lots of things, including people and dogs, become more confident and less fearful? Her particular goal, or one of them, is to add a dog sibling um, to the household one day. So she's wondering about confidence building and reducing fear. 
Oh, that's that's really lovely. So you can work on the fear of other people and you can work on the fear of other dogs. So you can do that. You can use counter conditioning, which I'm sure Kelly has told you all about before. Um, basically, there's training techniques where we can teach the dog not to be afraid of new people, new dogs, whatever it is they're afraid of, because we're going to always make sure that when something happens that the dog considers scary, we give them the ultimate snack. So a big piece of cheese or steak or sardine or something like that. And we can use that technique over time to make a big difference to how the dog feels. But the other thing that's important is you need to use management while that's going on because you have to keep your dog feeling safe. So you have to make sure that they're not put in situations where they're scared of strangers coming up to pet them or other dogs running up to see them. But the other thing, since you especially mentioned you want to get another dog, I think you would want to give some thought to what kind of dog maybe you're thinking of a puppy but if you're thinking of an older dog of course make sure that they are friendly and confident and going to be really well behaved with your existing dog and then also if you happen to know dogs like that or you know a dog trainer who can help set you up for play dates with dogs like that you can use play sessions like that to help to get your Get your dog used to being around other dogs in situations where you know you can absolutely trust the other dog to be completely friendly all of the time. You know, not, they're not going to respond badly if something, you know, if there's some growling or something like that. And that can be that can be done as well. Yes, those dogs are worth their weight in gold. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> so, Eddie, you're, um, some training to help your dog as um, you're probably already doing some of that and controlling her interactions with other dogs and trying to make them safe and positive sounds like the way to go. And I know that can be hard to do in the real world sometimes, but if you have a trainer helping you, they can probably um, help you find good dogs to practice with. Um, and Christina, I hope that also addresses your question a little bit of uh, scared of kids. Um, same kind of thing. You know, when your dog sees children, um, or hears them, can something good happen for your dog every single time? Um, some dogs seem to like to do um, do better if, if they have tricks that they really like doing and you can cue a trick and give them a treat, that would also work. Um, but yeah, we're working in little steps and, and keeping your dog away from children, um, at least at the level that scares scares him is really important otherwise it'll just um, it often will just get worse um speaking of Catherine asks how do you desensitize a dog who is not food motivated that's a very common question so one of the things is that you you often find that the dog is not food motivated when they're actually still quite scared. So it can really help if at all possible to change the environment or the situation so that you dial things down a bit and you make things a bit easier and more relaxed for the dog. And maybe then they will start to take treats. Sometimes that's not possible at all. And that's when I would recommend seeing a vet in case they would like to prescribe medication, because what can happen then is the medication can do the job of dialing things down a little bit so that you're training can work but another thing to do is to make sure that you're using really really good treats so they're things that your dog absolutely loves and the other thing to do is to still offer it even if your dog is not going to take it so suppose you're out and about and it's not a training session and your dog is afraid of loud noises and suddenly there's a bang um, make sure that you've always got really great treats on your person that you can offer to the dog even if they're not going to take them because they will notice that it's being offered and I've got a chapter in Bark in which I tell a story about my own late dog Bodger and his fear of loud noises and how he was in the beginning too scared to take the treats but you can read about how over time he did end up taking the treats and getting much much better with the noises so that's a personal story that I put into the book nice. but you might find that quite helpful oh that's a great one so check check that one out Catherine that sounds like it'd be really helpful for you um pancake is whispering at the moment let's hope it stays that way um marisa just asked if um she's um, on vancouver island and asking if you are doing training or working with people's dogs or just writing books your blog organizing book festivals your <laughs> <Just. book> club, <laughs> <et cetera. laughs> so 
I have had to take a break from taking clients while I finished the book, promoted the book. I hope to be back to taking clients again within the next month or so. Um, So I take online clients within Canada, basically. Um, So I will be back to that soon. But in the meantime, for people in BC, I especially recommend the Animal Kind trainers from the BCSPCA. There are several on the island and there are also several who take Zoom clients from other parts of BC too. So um, okay, I, would, I would look at that list and find a, a trainer from there if you if you don't want to wait. Okay. Animal Kind listing and Zazie will be available in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not right this second um okay Oli asks what are your thoughts on training anxious dogs to use the word buttons um like fluent pet to help with communication is this something that could be potentially easy to mess up and end up making the dog feel more anxious or generally a good idea to try I think if you feel like giving it a try, there is no harm in giving it a try. So um, because you will be recording your voice onto the button, so it's not like the buttons are going to make scary loud noises or anything like that. And the training should be fun. So if you want to, then then give it a go. I think I'm quite impressed by the training that I've seen people do with that. Um, I haven't tried it myself, but it just seems like a fun activity. And I think fun activities are always good for any dog, but especially for an anxious fearful dog so there's no harm in giving it a try see how it goes all right um let's see camilla asks um how this is we see this a lot or i bet a lot of you see this with um your fearful dogs um how do you teach a dog to basically not go where they're going to be scared so not approach the scary thing she says sometimes her dog approaches the dog and seems to think it's a good idea (laughs) and then panics um once he's there so how can she help him learn not to do that Oh, I think that's really hard. I think one thing that you could do is if you have a good recall, so you've taught them really well to come when called, you could maybe let them approach and then call them away or encourage them away with treats so that you're keeping that time scale quite short so that they don't have time to stay long enough to to get panicked. And the other thing is, if you know any of those amazing dogs that we talked about earlier that are no problem with any other dog and they're (laughs) always friendly, um, you could maybe engineer some meetings with that kind of dog because that could be quite helpful as a way for the dog to gain a bit more confidence um, in a situation where you know the other dog isn't going to do anything. Of course, that means they they may still panic themselves because it's their feeling of safety is what is important, not our expectation of what it will be. But that would maybe be a way to help them get a bit more confidence in those situations. So you can kind of manage the interactions and maybe sometimes if you if you get good at reading a dog's body language, you might sometimes recognize that, OK, this dog is going to be OK. They're less likely to have an issue, but that dog maybe is going to be too bouncy for them or maybe just not very reliably friendly. And you can stop your dog from meeting those dogs. So you can be a bit choosy in who you let your dog to meet and try and kind of make it like we would call it scaffolding in education. So you're starting with something easy and you're trying to make then you gradually make it a bit a bit harder. So something like that to try and provide a bit of structure to those meetings might be helpful too. Yeah, that's a great idea. So Camilla, if you can find um, known known helper dogs, that might be a nice way to do it. But even if you can't, having a um, a recall within a second or two of your dog getting close to another dog might might help. And that might be something you could slowly extend the delay um, over time. But you would want to make sure that the dog that you're letting, this is Monty, I think, letting Monty approach isn't um, going to confirm his fear <laughs> of, yeah. of dogs by, you know, <laughs> lunging at him or something. I know how tough that is. Um, She had one other question, which was, how do you teach a dog to take initiative in training? Her dog responds well to cues, but seems afraid to try things on his own. 
Oh, well, it's really sweet that you've done some training and already got the dog to respond to some cues. So that's wonderful. I think sometimes dogs can be a bit reluctant to offer new behaviors if they're a bit fearful or anxious, but also sometimes they can be so focused on getting that treat that they're waiting to be told, you know, what to do to get the treat. <laughs> Give me the treat. I'm only going to do that thing. But often once a dog knows several behaviors, um, you can reach a point where they will quite adorably start going through all of those different behaviors if they're not sure what you want so you could just pick anything and reinforce it you could try following Kathy Sadeo's smart 50 thing where you you have 50 small treats at the start of the day and over the day you're just going to give them out for whatever so then your dog would be getting treats for lots of different things and that maybe might encourage them to start trying a few different behaviors because you'll be giving treats while they're lying down moving around all kinds of things and that might be helpful mm -hmm. too yeah so that would be something else to try kelly you've probably got some good ideas on this one too well i happen to, i happen to know this dog a little bit and i i think that um the smart 50 is a really might be a really good suggestion for him because I believe he does know quite a few tricks. Um, but he has perhaps he's just learned that what you do to get the treat is to wait for someone to tell you what you do to get the treat. And so the nice thing about smart 50 is that you're just noticing something the dog is already doing. Um, and which would mean that he would be you would probably have lots of things to reinforce that he would have already done or be doing without you having given a cue. So um, I think that might be a nice low pressure way to start for him, especially. And I know there are some, some dogs that if they don't know what you want, they seem to get more and more stressed. Some dogs find verbal cues really um, seem to find them aversive. Maybe it's just us talking to them or our attention on them. Whereas other dogs, if there is no cue forthcoming, but they think, you know, there's food present. So it's like part of the pic part of the antecedent or the picture for, you know, doing something to get food is there, but there's no cue. They, eh, they seem to have some anxiety over that. So I know Monty's very sensitive. So um, Camilla, I think maybe try the smart 50 if you haven't already and see mm -hmm. if you, um, it might just be some, you know, pleasant surprises for Monty throughout the day. Um, oh, Amy, I was actually just getting to your question. Um, Okay, so Amy is a pet sitter, and she was asking about whether um, if you've got a dog who's fearful and potentially aggressive toward new people, is is it, as a general rule, better to be seated or standing? Um, That's a good question. I think, as a general rule, it's better to make sure that you're going to be safe and the dog is muzzled if you know that they're aggressive for one thing and that you're keeping your distance if you know that they're aggressive but suppose if I had to meet a dog that might be aggressive I would personally prefer to be standing up rather than sitting down and also not looking directly at them but maybe even stood slightly sideways I would be keeping a close eye on them and not moving because I think you know like how we teach children to be a tree to to make sure that they're not going to get bitten by a dog the same thing works for adults too I've had to do that various times and you just keep absolutely still you don't stare at the dog but right. you keep an eye on them and then usually you can back away or they will lose interest and back away or whatever so I, I would be a bit more nervous if I was sitting on the settee because my face would be closer to their head height for one thing and I wouldn't like that um, but I think if you know that a dog is, is aggressive, then maybe you don't want to meet them. Or if your dog is aggressive, maybe you don't want them to meet other people, except under very carefully arranged situations. And it would be important to muzzle train the dog so that people are, are safe. And that can take a few weeks of positive reinforcement training. You can't just stick the muzzle on the dog and expect them to like it. And then the other thing would be to be very careful with barriers or doors to keep people away from the dog. And um, there, we don't have to necessarily meet an aggressive dog in order to train them. So we can do a lot over Zoom, for example, of, of explaining to people what to do. Um, if you have to, then then I would I would think quite carefully about that, depending on the history, because you don't want to get bitten. And of course, you don't want the dog to be in a situation where they're going to get bitten, because that can have catastrophic consequences for the dog as well as for you. So it's something to be very careful about. Yes. Um, yeah. So Amy, 
Um, so Amy can't avoid meeting necessarily unless she declines them as a client. because She's a professional pet sitter, but, um, okay. and this dog was muzzled, right, Amy? So that's good. Good. Um, but I think perhaps not, um, it sounds like letting the dog approach you. I, it sounds like the dog may have been loose. Um, I, you know, perhaps having the dog on the leash would have been an additional safety measure, um, in addition to standing, you know, maybe pointing your shoulder toward the dogs as, as, as he said, so you're not staring, um, or, you know, facing them uh, and um, maybe not in their own home sometimes is if this, this was in the dog's own home, sometimes meeting outside is a little bit better. Yeah, I would agree with that too. I think to meet outside in the street or in the yard outside the home is, is going to be easier because if you're in the home, I think there's more of a risk and it's more stressful for the dog as well. So. Yeah. Yeah. I know pet, pet sitters who work with fearful dogs and potentially aggressive dogs, you're, you're in a tough spot. Um, and I usually, or I don't know if usually is the right word, but I often will work with clients and pet sitters together on zoom for several sessions before we try an actual pet sitting, um, stay. Cause it, it is, it's tough with these dogs. And sometimes you do need, um, Amy, if this is a dog, you'd be staying, you know, taking care of for multiple days and the dog can't wear a muzzle that long, um, you might need to find other ways to have pr basically protected contact in the house where the dog can't actually, you can, you know, deliver food and do the basics, but the dog can't get to you. Um, okay. Let's see. Rachel is asking about um, a situation in which her dog freezes up and um in particular she says that her dog lets her clip the leash on but then freezes or shuts down what can i do um and i i think probably lots of people on the call have dogs who um who f have that freezing response to scary stuff uh, what do you recommend for that kind of thing and that can be really difficult because you know, you need to be able to get the leash on the dog to be able to take them outside, but it can take you quite a lot of training to get them used to it. So, I mean, one thing is to think about what you're clipping the leash to, whether it's the collar or the or a harness, because sometimes it actually works better to get a harness on the dog first and clip it to that because it's not applying pressure around the neck, which they often don't like. Also, you can think when you're clipping the leash on, it's it's restricting their movements, but it's also applying weight to their neck. So you can think of using lighter leashes or short, tiny little leashes that you just clip on and literally take off. And then over time, you can maybe build up to clip, leave it on for a second, take it off and so on. So you can work through a training plan like that. I think you've actually got a training plan for this, haven't you, Kelly? I have um, pancakes, some of pancakes training steps we did. Yeah, um, I had a really small leash already, but um, who is this again? But Rachel, if you can get a cat leash, sometimes that's the, like the smallest one you could find. That might be a good light one. And then like, like Zazie said, that really short duration can help. And then once they're used to it being on, don't expect to immediately go to taking them for a leash, <laughs> leashed walk. Let them be around at home with the trailing the leash behind them in a safe space and get used to it that way. Because the other part of it is this fact of it restricting their movement. And, and you then also, when you are taking them for walks on the leash, make sure as much as you can that you are following them rather than expecting them to follow you. Because that also gives them more control of it and it avoids putting them in situations where they want to get away, but they can't because of the leash. So I think it's quite a slow and, and gradual process, unfortunately. But yeah. the slower you take it, the more likely it is to work. So the slower you are in the beginning, the faster you will get to the end. And I think that's quite a hard lesson for us to learn. But that applies to most things that you do with fearful dogs. You really have to be very slow at the beginning. Um, and again, think about those treats that you're using. So not kibble, make sure it's some really nice kind of treats that you're using in the training too. So clip, treat, remove clip you know, really quick in the first place. And even if you've got a light leash, you can also use your hand to, to take some of the weight of the leash and that can help too. And then yeah. there's the sound of the click. So you might also want to work on the sound of the sound of it being clipped on without actually clipping it to the dog. So you might need a spare 
a spare collar or harness or something that you can work on the sound of the click they get a treat and so on so build up from that so you can break it into really tiny tiny steps yes it can be hard um I know it um it's really hard, Rachel, when you're trying, you know, you would like to take your dog out to unleash. Um, and it's sometimes really hard to move as slowly as our fearful dogs need us to, or even to know how slowly that is. Um, and it can sometimes seem impossible, but uh, it is, it can be done most of the time. Um, you might need to work with a trainer um, if you have a dog who's really fearful. Just having a trainer who knows how to break it down into those tiny pieces for you might make a big difference. Um, yeah. I wouldn't have minded something, someone telling me what to do at times with pancake or it's like, <laughs> <laughs> I'm too tired to think of another training plan right now. Um, okay. Wait, no, I should do these two. Uh, we're actually almost done with pre-submitted and we have a just a couple in the chat. So maybe we can get through those um kathleen has a question that um is kind of the opposite of fear in a way she said her dog doesn't bark when someone comes to the door she goes to the door and acts friendly to everybody even strangers <laughs> i don't think she would protect me if someone broke into our house i've never had a dog who didn't bark when a stranger comes to the door what causes this well, I think that's a really lucky problem to have. <laughs> I think a lot of people would think that. I think it's great to have such a friendly dog. Now, I actually, I used to, some dogs just don't bark very much. And I used to have a long time ago, a dog who did not bark. He rarely barked and he was friendly to everyone. And I used to joke that, you know, someone could come and rob the house and he would just let them and he wouldn't care. But then one evening I was walking him on quite a secluded road and it was going dark and there was a guy just standing there with his motorbike and I just I didn't feel quite comfortable you know because it was quite wooded and I was thinking oh I shouldn't have gone down here at this this time of night and my dog growled at him and he's never growled at anybody before <laughs> and the guy was like hmm and he actually he, like he was he was going to talk to me and then he this dog was a husky type dog. He said, is, is that a wolf? So I just said, yes. <laughs> You're like, yes. So, um, you know, so <laughs> he was being growled at by this wolfy looking dog. He took a step back. But I never would have predicted that this, that this dog would have ever growled at anybody, you know, and I think it was just in those circumstances. So I think your dog, perhaps they would actually, if you needed it, they probably would step in and protect you. And I think it's lovely that they're so friendly to all the people who come to your home. I think that's really, really nice. And lots and lots of people would really really love to have a dog like that so I would yes. treasure that and I'm sure they would protect you if they had to yes congratulations Kathleen many people would and do pay thousands of dollars to try to get their dog to behave that way um, believe it or not towards strangers um, so that's it's wonderful um, Patty said and Patty I don't know if this was um you meant this as a question, but I'm going to read it just in case Zazie has anything to, to comment on about it. Um, she said, the fact that it takes an extraordinary combination and numbers and max doses of, of medications to sedate my not yet four-year-old dog makes me wonder if she lives in a chronic state of high anxiety, even, it, even when it is not apparent by hyperactivity or body language that indicates anxiety. So is this sedation just happening at the vet? Is that is that what the comment is about or I don't think no, I no. I also know this dog um somewhat and I they've also tried it for other um I don't know if they're less stressful, but like visiting, I believe, and Patty, correct me if I'm wrong, but like going to um a friend's home where he needs to hang out in a crate, you know, next to his mom or something. Mm. Um, I'm sure the vet is one of those things and then possibly for absences because I believe he also has some separation anxiety yeah so I think that's really quite 
hard and but the things to do are to think about what would be good for any dog so we can talk about that safe space again that safe space is so important and it has to be a space where they can go choose to come and go from so if you're using a crate to put them in sometimes that crate can't be the safe space so and then also think about giving them choices choices of when you pet them choices of whether or not they want to come and play games with you or take part in training sessions with you or all those kinds of things um and make sure that they're getting lots of opportunities to still engage in normal doggy behaviors and that would include things like opportunities to sniff so making sure they get those chances to sniff you probably do this anyway but lots of sniff aries on walks or chances to find treats that you've just thrown into the grass or into the room or something like that all of those kinds of things are helpful to help make dogs less stressed and less anxious so they're all worth doing um all right so i hope that was um I hope that is helpful, Patty. I don't know. I don't know what other measures you can look at to try to judge whether there is anxiety in the absence of anxious behavior or body language. Um, you know, sometimes I assume you're including things um, like pupil dilation and panting um, in your body yeah. language list and, and if all of that looks totally normal um i'm not sure if there's something else you could do i mean short of i suppose trying to um measure you know stress hormones or something which isn't you know particularly practical but the other thing could be to get someone else to look at the dog so someone like you kelly who is really has a lot of experience at it because we know that learning to read dogs body language is a skill and sometimes there can be subtle signs that you might miss but that someone with more experience will be able to get and I think all of us benefit from having someone with more experience we can go to when we have questions like this so um, there's no shame in asking it's a good thing to do so finding someone else to look at a bit of video that you just happen to have taken for example that might be quite helpful too if you're not sure. Yeah, I am I find video really helpful both for my own dogs and um to look at client dogs. The more video the better, honestly. Um anything that can show how your dog looks in a normal day-to-day -day situation um is great. Okay, Christina asked, "Do dogs forget people?" I'm worried that when my daughter comes home from college soon, the dog only knew her for about a month before leaving for college. Any tips? I think dogs have really good memories. And there is a tiny bit of research that dogs do still recognize people after quite a long time. And sometimes other dogs even as well. So the chances are that, that she will be recognized when she comes home. And if not, in any case, you know, it, if it was like meeting someone new, I'm sure the dog will get used to liking her being around anyway. So I, I, I hope that she gets a really wonderful welcome home. And I think that's the most likely thing to happen, even though they didn't know each other for very long beforehand. Um, Christina, I don't know if you're still on, but um, does I'd be curious to know if the, this new dog that your daughter met for a month, are they generally friendly with people coming to the house or are you worried because they are generally unfriendly with, <laughs> with people coming into the house? That um, If they're usually friendly, I wouldn't worry about it. But, um, you know, if, if they're, if your dog worries and, you know, isn't always friendly, if someone comes in the door, you might consider just a little, um, slightly gradual you know maybe meet outside and go for a little walk together or something and see if that helps um but good luck yeah. i hope i hope it goes smoothly i'm sure your dog i'm sure the dog will remember her um but yeah i take it slow a little slowly if your dog is generally not friendly to people that they um, aren't in the immediate family oh marisa says um I've heard it said that dogs can become conditioned to food refusal behavior if one continually offers food and they refuse. But you say the opposite. I think she's talking about your story um, with your dog and the sounds. Is the distinction that you continue to offer it in the presence of something scary versus offering in more of a mark and reward for desirable behavior like Smart 50? 
so in in a counter conditioning situation when you're working with a fearful dog you're not looking for any particular type of behavior you're tr working to try and change the dog's emotion so you're going to offer the food regardless of what the dog is doing and that's a bit different than when we're using smart 50 or we're teaching a dog to do particular behaviors when we're making the food contingent on it now there can be various situations in which dogs will stop taking food and actually kathy sadeo has a wonderful webinar about dogs who refuse food and how to get them to start taking food again so i would look at some of kathy sadeo's work because she's amazing um and but no so it, i mean if that was in relation to my story about Bodger, he didn't stop liking the food so but there is an important thing here to do with the actual technique so when you're doing counter condition counter conditioning it's one of those things where the technique really matters a lot and what you want to make sure happens is that the thing that's considered scary is predicting the wonderful treats and what can happen is that suppose you're working with a reactive dog and you've got lots of great treats and you see the dog, but your dog hasn't seen the other dog yet, and you get the treats out and offer it them. What's actually happening is you've got your order of events wrong, and you're teaching them that the food predicts the scary thing. And then sometimes you will get, they, you offer the food, and they're like, what, what, where, where is the other dog? And start looking around. Yeah. So if you see that happening, that's a tip off that your technique isn't quite right and you can improve your technique and make sure that you're paying attention in this example to the dog's body language and you know that they spotted the dog before you actually start to offer them the treat so i hope that answers your question and gets it gets at what you were asking about yeah that's um that's a great point that the order really matters when you present the food and what comes after it um Similarly, I had this experience recently with my um, one of my senior dogs that um, who was feeling nauseated from being sick and more and more foods became essentially poisoned for him. He wouldn't take them because they were the smell, sight or taste of them was followed by being nauseated. Um, so Marisa, um, shoot me a, a message or an email if um, I think I I watched um a recent web kathy city webinar on this topic that i and you um, i can find the link for you but um just refusing food i don't think in and of itself can sort of you know like cause an aversion to the food um either something you know they eat and they feel bad or they eat and something scary happens um might cause them to then start refusing food or let's say you hold out a treat and they find your hand reaching toward them scary and they're like, they turn their head away and then you remove your hand away. That could be uh, negatively reinforcing um, that turning away from the food. Um, also, those of you who have dogs who are picky and you keep upgrading their meals, that can sometimes positively reinforce bulking at their food bowls. You know, you're like, oh, you don't want that. Here's some other stuff, you know, just keep adding good things. Um, I've definitely done that <laughs> um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> with a dog who wasn't feeling well because I wanted him to eat. So um, yeah, you want to look at either the association or the consequence of the food refusal um, to figure out, well, am I, am I creating this problem or is it um, something more to do with just the dog just has bigger problems right now or, or is worrying about other things. Um, Claire says, any big mistakes or regrets you've had on your journey working with fearful dogs? Um, for sure, there are things that I wasn't very good at. I, I kind of wish I had learned more about the technique earlier on. In a way, I'm lucky because I'm not someone who ever used aversive training. I, I had a very hippie upbringing, so I, I kind of was brought up never to do that anyway. So that's that was just that was just luck. <laughs> um, I think that was just just chance. And there are always times when I wish I had learned more. There's a specific instance in wag where I write about trying to teach Bodger to get used to the sound of the barred owl that he was terrified of and I started playing the sound of an owl he was in another room I was actually in here and I had a recording of it and I played it really really quietly aiming to desensitize him to this thinking it would help 
but he just came rushing and barking like terrified where is the owl where is the owl I have to get rid of it in my house so, <laughs> yes so I felt terrible then and I think whenever something like that happens with a fearful or anxious dog you say oh no because sometimes however however much you plan things you can have a mistake and you do accidentally scare the dog and I always feel terrible in those moments and obviously I try not to make it happen at all but sometimes it does and I just think oh no I've just made things worse and now I have to do even more work to kind of make it better again (laughs) yeah so so those those I think would be my, my regrets those times when something like that has happened yeah, we've all been there. <laughs> we all make mistakes, you know, and, and I think the beauty is that we just keep on learning and, and getting better. And, and so long as that's happening, then it doesn't matter. The mistake becomes a learning experience and we learn something from it. So, yeah, um, I think there's just one, two questions left. OK, um, Stu asks, he has a, a pretty anxious poodle. And um, is there a brand of harness? like the best um I think the harness kind of tends to it has to match the dog so sometimes the particular harness you like best doesn't match the dog I like the rough wear harnesses um but I think you know whatever you there are lots of different brands available so so long as it's not a harness that tightens on the dog because that's not good for them especially if they're anxious or fearful but luckily most harnesses aren't like that so I, the freedom has some good harnesses too you probably have some favorites as well kelly but i think it's it's making it fit the dog is the most important thing and, and most harnesses will fit most dogs but sometimes they don't quite fit as well so it's what works for your budget and your dog yeah um there's also the the type and amount of handling required to get it on the dog I know a lot of you here um have dogs who aren't big on body handling so in that that might also affect your choice but I I also I have rough wear harnesses several of them um, which is mostly what I use these days Amy says will you send a link to rewatch the session I joined late um yes Amy if you're on the email list already I'll send um I'll send out a link. I'll put it into a a blog and I'll send it out tomorrow. So you'll get that tomorrow. Yeah, Marisa says rough wear is good, but they they go over the head. There's no, unless you modify it, there's no buckle. So you do, they do have to be able to go over the head. Sorry. Other dog is currently entering because they think it's dinner time. And now there's barking. (laughs) Okay, Bubba. Okay, last question. One moment. Okay, buddy. Here, buddy. Okay. Um, this is my question. If you have to choose one takeaway to leave readers, um, of Bark and all of our wonderful um attendees that are here, uh, what would it be? And I know that's hard with a whole book to pick one thing, but what if you had to pick one just for today? What would one good one be? I guess. There are lots of tips in the book. So if it's a tip for a person, I would say that it's just the idea of hope that there are so many things that you can do that will make a big difference to your fearful and anxious dog. So if you're struggling, reach out for help, but don't give up hope. There is hope. And if it's a tip for what you do with your dog, I think it would be one that we've mentioned already. And that's the idea of a safe space and making sure that your dog has this safe space in the home and that everybody in the home is going to recognize that this is a safe space. And if it's something like a dog bed, then it doesn't actually have any barriers around it. You have to kind of imagine that there's a barrier, an invisible barrier that the humans can't go through to keep, keep it as a dog. safe space. <laughs> yeah. To keep it as a safe space for the dog. Yeah. <laughs> That's Sorry, a, I picked two. That was that was a bit cheeky, but <laughs> I think it's great. Um, lots of thank yous for your sharing your wisdom. Um, thank you everybody for um, for coming and joining us. It's always so nice to have people live on the call, um, and to hear what you're you know what's going on with you and your dogs. Um, I know we have some really exceptional dog parents here. Um, all right, everyone. So if um, if you are on the email list already, you'll get this tomorrow. Don't worry about it. If you are not, you can leave a comment in the Facebook event where you're watching this and I'll send you how to um, how to get on the list so you get the email. 
All right. Thank you so much. This is really wonderful. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much for organizing it. And thank you to everyone for such wonderful questions, too. It's been my pleasure. All right. Have a wonderful evening. You too. Bye.